and we just thank you so much that you have given us the ability that we can meet together and to learn uh, the deeper things uh, through knowing your language. We just thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. I mean, we, we haven't had a lot when you consider how long a year is, <clears throat> but we've had some different Jewish people come and speak. Have you enjoyed having the different Jewish speakers come? <clears throat> The thing is this, as many of you know, most of them are, that do come are Orthodox. They don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And I, how many of you know that? Hopefully all of you knew that. And so they also are going to believe some things differently. Some of them put a lot of emphasis on the Talmud and, you know, but just know that if you want to learn, you've got to hear from them. And so that's why I want, it's not only for you guys, it's also for them to meet us because we want to build bridges, not burn bridges. And so that's our whole point. You know, I, I think they know when they come that we believe in the Messiah. And we know when they come that they don't believe in the Messiah. But at the same time, I believe there are things that we can learn. And one of the things I always say is you have to know how to eat chicken. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to not eat a T-bone steak because there's a bone in it. Okay? I'm still going to eat the T-bone. Well, like with anything, you know, so we have to sort. And uh, I just appreciate you guys having a willing heart to listen to the Jewish people. For heaven's sake, for 2,000 years, Christianity and Judaism has been at loggerheads. Don't you think it's about time we at least listen to each other? And no, we're going to have point of disagreements, but hey, that's okay. How many of you agree with your spouse all the time? Okay, and you still listen to them. So, <clears throat> I don't know if you understand, but no. Okay, so let's take a look now at Rabbi Shaul. Now, who knows who Rabbi Shaul? Who does not know who Rabbi Shaul is? Everybody here should know who Rabbi Shaul is. That's just another name for the Apostle Paul. That's his real name. Okay, so let's put our first clip up. You have a Torah scroll is what I believe you're seeing. If I turn around, I'm not sure I can see it because of the screens, but yes, it is. Let's, uh, what I wanted to do is lay a little bit of foundation here in Luke chapter 24, verse 44 and 45. It says, and he said unto them, these, now this is Yeshua speaking here, or Jesus. He says, he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses or the Torah of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning who? So when you see a Torah scroll, when you think Torah, here is what you should be seeing. Okay, so when you, right here, Yeshua himself said, the Torah is all about who? Yeah, that's what he said. So think of this, whenever you're throwing away a Torah scroll, it's like you're throwing away Yeshua. Because it's all about him, okay? And so he opened up their uh, understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now, if you'll notice, there's three categories he says here. He says the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. How many of you know, if you've seen the Hebrew Bible, it has all the books that we have, but they're in a different order. Okay? They're, they are in the order that Yeshua is referring to here. Because, now, have you guys heard of the term Tanakh? Okay, that's basically the word for the Old Testament. It's an acronym. The Torah is the T sound. Navim in Hebrew is the prophets. That's the N sound. And then the Ketavim is the writings. So the T and K is the Torah, the prophets, and the writing, but it's pronounced Tanakh, the Torah, the Navim, and the Ketavim. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go and look at verse 50 through 53 of that same chapter. <clears throat> Here it says, Yeshua led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And then it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and he was carried up into heaven and they worshiped him. They returned to Jerusalem with what? Great joy. And what does it say? They were continually where? What? You mean they weren't hiding out? No. They were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So <clears throat> guess where they were after he ascended? Every day. Okay. They were in the temple. There was nothing wrong with the temple. They loved the temple. And it says they were there continually, praising and blessing God. Let's look at Acts chapter 5, verse 41 and 42. 
It says, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And it says, and they were what? Daily, where? Again, they were not hiding out. Where did they meet? In the temple, daily, and in every house as well. They ceased not to teach and preach Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua is the Messiah. So where did all the believing Jews hang out? In the temple. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but when the 3,000 that believed in the book of Acts, everyone familiar with that? Did you know basically none of them were Gentiles? The Gentiles aren't going to be coming to the feasts. There may be some Gentiles who had converted to Judaism, or some God-fearers, like Cornelius, that were there, but it's not like there were all these wicked pagans that decided to go to the temple on Pentecost, okay? <clears throat> So now let's look at uh, Acts chapter 6. Let's continue. Verse 7 through 14. It says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples did what? Now we're talking about multiplication now, and they were multiplying in what city? In Jerusalem, and they were multiplying greatly. And there was a great company of who? Oh my goodness, we see there's a great company of the priests that were obedient to the faith. Can you imagine? I mean, most people just don't catch that. There was thousands and thousands of priests who were obedient to the faith. And you know what? They continued the temple sacrifices for another 40 years. Think about that for a minute. I mean, that, that may be something hard for you to chew on or to think about, but all the apostles, all the disciples, for another 40 years, they were believers, the priests were believers, and the sacrificial system continued. And then we see we have Stephen, <clears throat> who was full of faith and power, doing great wonders and great signs among the people. And then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, those from uh, Cilicia and Asia. And they were disputing with Stephen. And it says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And so notice what it says. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Okay, now wait a minute. That is telling you they were what? Lying. Okay, which tells you <clears throat> Stephen never spoke anything against Moses and never spoke anything against God. <clears throat> so they had to get people to lie saying he spoke against Moses. He never did. And so they stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes. They came upon him. They seized him. They brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses. And it's the false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the Torah. But those were lies. He never spoke anything against the temple. He never spoke anything against the Torah. Then they said this, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. <clears throat> that is another lie. Okay. <clears throat> Jesus did not come to destroy the temple. He did not come to change the customs which Moses delivered to him. Now, <clears throat> here's what's important. When you read the book of Acts, you have to realize there's a time frame. Yes. You know, the rabbinic uh, followers believed that Moses was given two different... Uh, the oral Torah the you're oral referring Torah. to. And is, <clears throat> is, is, are those the customs that they're talking about here? Okay. <clears throat> well, if you remember too, Yeshua also was saying, look, you have heard it said, but I say this. So <clears throat> he obviously, I think, was referring to the oral Torah, but he, I believe some of the oral Torah uh, he did not adhere to at all and had to bring correct understanding to. So uh, exactly which customs he was referring to there, it, it doesn't say that the rabbis brought to us, it says that Moses delivered to us. You know, yeah, and so there's, uh, I wasn't there to find out exactly what that was, but I think, you know, obviously Yeshua had a problem with a lot of the oral Torah, but I believe there also was some that he agreed with. And so it's a matter of sorting it out. But here's what's important. Look at in Acts 21. Now I want you to realize 30 years has gone by since Messiah's death. Okay. He died 
approximately 30 AD. It is now 60 AD, so 30 years has gone by when Acts 21 is being written. This is 10 years before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So realize for 30 years, the believing priests and believing disciples and the apostles all continued with the sacrificial system. But now let's look at Acts 21, 17 through 20, which is 30 years later. It says, and when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. And it says, and when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many tens of thousands is the correct translation here of Jews. Tens of thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the Torah. So here you have 30 years have gone by. You've got believing priests, believing apostles. They're all Jewish, and they still follow the Torah. They're still zealous for Torah, and they're still part of the temple system. And there wasn't just a few. There was tens of thousands And this is 30 years later, so it's not like after five years they go, gee, we really got this wrong, we need to chuck the Torah. I mean, these were the founders, basically, and they were saying, look, we're still zealous for Torah 30 years later. Now, let's go to Acts 21, 21. Now they're talking to Rabbi Shaul, or Apostle Paul, and they said this. Now, who's speaking to him but Peter and James? Okay, these are the leaders the very leader leaders. And they say, we are informed concerning you that you teach all the Jews who are among the nations to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor walk after the customs again. Okay, so here Peter and James are saying, look, what is going on here? So it looks like Paul was misunderstood back then just as he is now, okay? But here we see that the apostles and the leaders of, now I have here in your notes, I don't say the the leaders of the early church because the church had already been in existence for 1,500 years. That may come as a shock to some people. The early church was at the time of Moses. It wasn't at the time of the apostles. So I like to say the apostles and leaders in the Messianic times were concerned about the Messianic Jews or the believing Jews who were not keeping Torah. So think about it. 30 years after Messiah died, Peter and James are concerned that there's a rumor going around that Paul is saying Torah's done away with. And so they say, look, Paul, we want to make sure that you realize the Torah's not done away with. And this is Peter and James who are talking to Paul. <clears throat> and so uh, as a matter of fact, look at what James, and in case you didn't know, James' name really was Jacob. <clears throat> But look at his own words in the book of Jacob or James in chapter one, verse 25. He said, whoever looks into the perfect Torah of liberty. Now, when most people hear Torah, do they think liberty or do they think chains and bondage? But this is the Torah of liberty and continues therein. So whoever's looking into the perfect Torah of liberty continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer. Remember the word Shema, hear and do of the work. This man is the one who's going to be blessed in his deed. As a matter of fact, if you look at Psalms 119, verse 44 and 45, look at what the psalmist said. So shall I keep your Torah continually forever and ever, and I will walk where? At, oh my goodness, for I seek your precepts. So here we see the psalmist realizes, keeping the Torah continually forever and ever, that that's how they're going to walk in liberty. This is what James is pulling from. This is where James got his concepts from. But it was rumored that Paul taught Jews the Torah was done away with. And so we see this is a rumor. And so what is the solution that Peter and James decide to squash that rumor? We see in Acts 18, 18, we're going to go back a couple chapters first. It says that Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, then took his leave of the brethren. He sailed then to Syria, and with them were Priscilla and Aquila. And then it says, having shorn his head in Kentria, for he had a vow. When it says he had shorn his head, what kind of a vow had he taken? 
a Nazarite vow. So let's take a look at this in number six, one through five. Here it says, the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when neither a man or a woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of, uh, let me see, strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy and he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. Okay. But now, what does it say happens? In verse 13 through 15, it says, and this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, okay, when he's, he said, I'm gonna be a Nazarite vow, I'm gonna take it for a year or for two years or for six months, whatever. Once it was over, it says, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He shall offer his offering to the Lord and look at what he has to offer. Look at all these different things and begin to add up in your mind what the costs are here. He has to offer up a male lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, a female lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, one ram without blemish for peace offerings, a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering and their drink offerings. First off, how many of you know if you're gonna buy a lamb, having it without blemish alone is gonna increase the cost? And you've got to buy a male lamb, you've got to buy a female lamb. You have to also buy a ram. Now, that's going to be even more expensive. And it also has to be without blemish. Then you've got to get your unleavened bread uh, and oil. You gotta, that's going to be expensive. So <clears throat> when you, and a Nazarite vow is voluntary. You didn't have to, but if you're going to do it, it's going to cost you something. Okay? And so here, this is a, a, a very expensive to be doing this. And now let's look at number six, verse 18. And then it says at the end, the Nazarite shall then shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he takes his hair and he puts it in the fire, which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. So they shave all their hair and they take all their hair and they throw it into the sacrificial offering. Okay, so here we saw that's exactly what Paul had did done. <clears throat> okay. Acts 21, verse 23 and 24. So here, Peter and James tell Paul, okay, look, here's what we want you to do to prove to everyone that this rumor is false, that you think the Torah is done away with, when we know when you know the Torah is not done away with. He says, do this. We have four other believers, or Jewish Messianic Jews, which have a vow on them. They also took this vow. Take them and purify yourself with them and pay for all their offerings that they have to do. So now it's like, oh my gosh, I gotta put out the big bucks. Paul says, not only do I have to pay for all of my own offerings, I've gotta pay for four other guys as well. That they may shave their heads. Because here's the thing, if their vow ended, but they didn't have the money to pay for the vows, they had to keep going. And so maybe these people didn't have the money. I don't know. But Paul, they said, I want you to pay for everything. And they said, the reason for this is that all may know that those things where they were informed concerning you are nothing. They're false. But that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the Torah. This is 30 years later, guys. This is 30 years after the Messiah had died. Paul has gotten saved. He's gone on several missionary journeys. And here it's Peter and James that are telling Paul, we want to make sure you know that everyone else knows that you keep Torah. So here were four Jewish believers along with Paul under the direction of the apostles doing sacrifices also. Did you notice that? That meant they had to be doing sacrifices to offer up all these lambs and rams. So again, it was under the direction of the James, the brother of Jesus, and Peter that Paul do sacrifices in the temple, not only for himself, but for four other guys. And again, this is 30 years later. And so this proved the rumors were false and that Paul still followed Torah. Now, do all of you get that Paul followed Torah and that he was doing sacrifices in the temple and Peter and James followed Torah and wanted to make sure everyone knew that Paul did? 
Now, I want you to realize this. When you read the book of Galatians, the book of Galatians was written seven years before this event. Okay? Timing is very important here. Galatians was written seven years before this event happened. Why is that important? Well, let's go and look at Galatians 2, 11 through 13. It says, when Peter had come to Antioch, Paul says, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed for before certain men came from James, he would eat with Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. So even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Everyone familiar with that verse? Okay, now remember, this, is, this event happened seven years earlier. Now, do you think Paul's going to be a hypocrite after accusing Peter of being a hypocrite? So do you think Paul meant it and what he did? Of course Paul meant what he did. So that tells us Paul is not going to be a hypocrite. I mean, he's already accusing Peter of being a hypocrite seven years earlier. So the fact that Paul is keeping Torah, what we're, we're seeing is that's his true self. He's not going to be a hypocrite. Look at Galatians 4, 8 through 11. Here he's speaking to the Galatians. Now, the Galatians were mostly Gentiles that didn't know Torah at all, and he's trying to train them. And it says, How be it then, when you did not even know God, he says, that you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements where you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. So I spoke about this verse a few weeks ago. I don't remember exactly when. But again, he wasn't talking to them. When you read these days and months and years, he's not talking about the Torah or the feast days. He's talking about all of the pagan holidays. They were astrologers. It was in Galatia where they were worshiping the Jupiter and Mars and Mercury and all the planets. And he's saying, oh my goodness, have I bestowed all this labor upon you in vain? I've been giving you the feast days and now you're going back again into your horoscopes and paganism like the year of the pig and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so so many people will use that verse to say, see, you're not supposed to keep the feast. Look at this. But you got to know the context of who he was talking to. So, you know what he was talking about. And when you realize that he still kept the feasts, he'd be a hypocrite telling the Gentiles not to do it. He'd be doing the same thing he was accusing Peter of. So. <clears throat> To think it meant that Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, did away with the Torah or God's instructions, then Paul's a hypocrite. For us to misunderstand these texts to mean anything Jewish, and here seven years later, Paul is doing very Jewish things, and he was either a very big hypocrite, or we have misinterpreted the text. And how many of you know, more than likely, as Gentiles, we probably misinterpreted the text, the context, everything. So now what I want to do now is kind of give you some misunderstood vocabulary. We're going to look at the word law. Okay. The most common Greek word is nomos. That is translated in English as law. And I want you to know we can refer to religious law or secular law. How many of you know, if you ever had a spitting ticket, that that was not a religious law? That was a civil law. Well, back then they had one word law and it could refer to the Torah or it could refer to just secular law, nothing to do with the Torah. Or it could just refer to principles. For example, uh, I want you to know first in the Septuagint, is there anyone here who does not know what the Septuagint is? The Septuagint is the scripture, the Torah written in Greek, a couple hundred years before Christ came. Um, they wanted to have there were a lot of Jews who spoke Greek and they didn't speak Hebrew. So they wrote a translation of the Torah in the Greek language and it's called the Septuagint. Okay, so this is the Torah written in Greek. And they had to find a word for Torah. Okay, so here they, Torah is the word that was in the Torah and they tried to decide, okay, how are we gonna, in the Greek, what Greek word are we gonna use for Torah? So they said, okay, let's use nomos, okay? And when nomos was translated into English, it was translated as law. But that is not a good English translation. Because Torah 
frequently does not mean law at all. For example, Genesis. Is Genesis part of the Torah? But there's no laws mentioned, okay? Covenants, the covenant with Noah, was that a law? Uh, no, I mean, so there's, there's a lot of things about the Torah that have nothing to do with law. What does Torah actually mean? It means instruction or teaching. So Torah does not really equal law. So law is a bad English translation of the Hebrew word Torah. Okay. So everyone say Torah does not equal law. And say Torah means teaching or instruction. So when someone says the Torah is done away with, you say, why would God do away with his teaching and instruction? It's God's teaching. Uh, in one sense, we shouldn't even be saying the law of Moses. It's the law of God spoken through Moses. It's his laws. It's his instruction. It's his teaching. Now, here's an example where nomos doesn't always mean law or law. It's, it's a bad translation for Torah, always meaning law. Let's look at this. Romans 7, 21. The Apostle Paul says, I found then, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present within me. Now, would it make sense to say, I find then Torah, the five books of Moses, let me put it that way. I find then the five books of Moses that when I do good, evil is present with me. Does it make sense, does it? Okay, so law, when you read the word law, it doesn't always mean Torah or the five books of Moses. Let's look at Romans 7, 23. He says, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Do either one of those refer to Torah? Neither one of them refer to Torah. So when you read the word law, you can't always assume it means the first five books. Law can mean all kinds of things. He says, and bring me into captivity of the law of sin. Well, here's the third law, a law of sin. That's not referring to the Torah either, which is in my members. So everywhere the word nomos was used when it referred to the Hebrew word Torah, why did they just write the word Torah instead of using the term law? Don't you think that would have made it a lot easier in the New Testament if when it was specifically referring to the five books of Moses, they would have just wrote Torah? Rather than trying to use an English word that doesn't fit or isn't accurate. So that's one of the problems that we have with our translations. They, put, they use the word law all the time. And how many of you know mankind in general are lawbreakers? That's not our forte. Oh, let's find some laws, make some up so I can obey. Okay, so let me put this up. Okay, there's a lot of misinterpretation. How many of you have heard of the terms, the works of the law? Or don't put me under the law. Okay, basically what that really means is legalism, not Torah. When people say the works of the law, they're really referring to legalism or under the law. That phrase when Paul's writing it, in one sense, don't think of Torah, but think of legalism, okay? Uh, under the law cannot mean following Torah. Otherwise, how could it mean that when Paul followed Torah? If James followed Torah, Peter followed Torah, Paul followed Torah, when they're saying under the law or works of the law per se, they're not always referring to Torah. I believe they're speaking about people who think they're saved by keeping the law, doing the law. Do you see what I'm saying? One, here's a, let me explain this. I have something that's really good that's coming up. In Romans 6, 14 through 16, he says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Now, did he just say of obedience leading to righteousness? Obeying What? First, he says, you're going to be a slave. You're a slave no matter what. You're either going to disobey and it'll be death, or you're going to obey and it'll lead to righteousness. So when you hear the word Torah, first off, I want you to think of God's instructions. 
And here's the other thing I mentioned before. Torah is not opposed to grace. Did you catch that? Torah is not in opposition to grace. Torah is grace. Did God have to give the Torah to mankind to begin with? Or could he have just left Adam and Eve off to die and say, forget it? And then what you need to realize, grace is found within Torah. That's where the grace is found. Now, I mentioned this before. If you have two people appearing before a judge and one guy speeds, has like 30 speeding tickets. The other guy gets his first ticket. Is the judge going to show more grace to the one who's only offended once, or is he going to show grace to the one who's totally lawless and saying, stick it in your ear, judge? Grace is not given to the lawless. Grace is given to those who fail, who are trying to keep the law. Does that make sense? Rabbis that the rabbis had uh, for years, I mean for centuries, had established an oral law that they felt superseded the, the uh, written law. Yes, and, and I'm so, coming to that in just a minute. That's further down your page. Oh, okay. So I'm just trying to say that when, when he was, because those laws were heavy and burdensome right. on the people. Right, and, and I'm going to get to that. And if they broke even? Yes. Right, that's, that's part of where I'm going to. Okay, so now, let's look at this. And you're going to see it on your notes, as a matter of fact. Okay, so, especially in light of what else he wrote in this same letter. Here we just read Romans 6, 14 through 16, where he said, you're not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace. Certainly not. Well, now, in this same letter, let's look at what he wrote. In Romans 3, verse 31, he says, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, what do we do? We're establishing the Torah. So is he doing away with Torah or trying to establish the Torah? Okay, so you have to look at things in context. Let's put up another clip here. I want you to notice God's Torah here. Let's look at Romans 7, verse 12. He says, therefore, the Torah is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good, and as a matter of fact, this isn't on your notes, I don't think, but Romans 7, 14 also says, for we know that the law is spiritual, or the Torah is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. So here we see God's Torah is holy, God's Torah is good, God's Torah is righteous, God's Torah is spiritual, okay? So Paul doesn't have a problem with it. As a matter of fact, Look at Romans 7.22. He says, I actually delight in the Torah of God according to the inward man. Romans 7.25. He goes on to say, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And how many know we're not supposed to be in the flesh? Okay, so Paul is saying, my mind is telling me I need to serve the law of God. I want to serve the Torah. But the problem is not with the Torah, it's with my flesh. And I'm serving the law of sin. Now, look at Romans 8, 4. Here's where it says that the righteous requirement of the Torah might be what? Fulfilled in us. Oh my goodness. Here this is telling us that we're supposed to be fulfilling the righteous requirements of the Torah. Okay? And it's, uh, let me read it from the beginning. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Okay, so if you walk according to the flesh, you're not walking according to Torah. If you're walking in the spirit, you are walking according to Torah. So Torah and spirit are not at opposites either. Matter of fact, here's the problem in Romans 8, 7. He says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God... For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So this is telling me who is opposed to the Torah of God is those who have a carnal mind. Do you see that? The carnal mind is enmity against God. The carnal mind hates God, and it refuses to subject itself to the Torah. That's the, that's the carnal man right there. And we have the phrase, the works of the law. In Galatians chapter 2, 16, it says, knowing that a man is not what? 
justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, so justification is by faith. But you know that also comes from the Tanakh. It's in Habakkuk. It says the just shall live by faith. All right. We're not justified by the works of the law. So that is by the works of the Torah here. But that's not what justifies us. Think of it this way. If you have, do you have an illegal immigrant problem here in America? Okay. If they come over here, an illegal immigrant, and if they keep all the laws... Does that make them illegal? Or does that make them a legal citizen just because they keep the laws? Absolutely not. So keeping the Torah doesn't make you a citizen of heaven. Okay? That's not how you get in. Legalism is attempting to earn your salvation by works. That's what legalism is. And there was no word for legalism in the Greek 2,000 years ago. This was Paul's problem. There wasn't a Greek equivalent of legalism. But this is what he's trying to explain. People who think just because you follow Torah, you're going to go to heaven, or just because you're physically Jewish, you're going to go to heaven, or just because you... How many of you know just because you come to church, that doesn't mean you're a saint? Now, <clears throat> this goes back again to what Nancy was talking about, the oral Torah. You know, the, the Jews had an oral Torah, and then they have the written Torah. And believe it or not, most rabbis put the oral Torah above the written Torah. They, they really believe that the oral Torah has priority over the written Torah, and the written Torah has no value compared to the oral Torah. And that's wrong. Okay, just so you know. Now, let's look at some hermeneutical principles. How many of you know Scripture will not contradict itself? It won't. We have to look at context. Well, the problem with the Galatians is they thought they could earn their salvation by works. These Galatians were the same ones that were worshiping the sun and the moon and the planets and everything else. And they thought the way they made God happy was by doing all these sacrifices to the planets. So they're carrying that same mindset when they become believers thinking now we have a different God who's happy with all of our works. And that's how we get in is by doing all these works. So that's who he's trying to teach here. Now, listen to this statement that I wrote here. Rabbi Shaul, or the Apostle Paul, did not teach against Torah, but against a legalistic observance of Torah in order to maintain salvation, to maintain that. Does that make sense? Now watch. This is much like what Christianity actually is doing today. How many churches teach, if you just say the magic words, you believe their doctrinal statements, you're going to heaven? It doesn't matter how you behave. Sin all you want, you're under grace. This is the very concept that Paul was speaking against here in Galatians. Here the church uses these texts to speak against the Torah when the text actually is speaking against the church saying you can just blab it and grab it. That is trying to establish your own righteousness. In other words, I'll say, women, you just can't wear makeup and you can't wear pants, you have to wear dresses. All you men, just make sure you tithe. Uh, say a few Hail Marys and a couple of our fathers and you're good. Come to church every Sunday for your sugar high and you are guaranteed to go to heaven. There are a lot of denominations out there that say if you just believe what their doctrinal statement is, you're in. That is what Galatians is against. There were a lot of Jews back then too that just thought, hey, I'm Jewish so I'm guaranteed to, to, to be in the kingdom of God when it comes just because I'm Jewish or just because I go to temple. Jeremiah 7, God tells all these Jews, he says, look, you think you're saying the temple, the temple. God will never destroy the place because we have God in our pocket. We have the temple. We do all the sacrifices. God says, I want nothing to do with that because it's not coming from your heart. You're doing it from a legalistic observance. That is what Paul is trying to tell the Galatians. You can't come to God and just think just because you do these things, you're going to be in the kingdom to come. But Christianity, who really bashes the Torah using these verses, doesn't realize they're doing the very same thing. And they totally misunderstand what that Paul was trying to say, is that what, what they're doing is what is wrong. Look at Romans 10, 1 through 3. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, 
but it's not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they're going about to establish what? Their own righteousness. And they don't submit themselves to the righteousness of God. So I've got two little clips here. Okay, the righteousness that comes from God is the Torah that's come down from heaven. That's all about grace. Okay, man's righteousness is legalism. They try to build all these laws and regulations and that's how you get to heaven. They say salvation equals grace plus faith plus works. But that's wrong. Salvation is just grace and faith, but that's gonna produce works. Romans 10, four, it says, for Messiah is the end of the law, but that's a mistranslation. It should be Messiah is the goal of the law. You'll see that uh, the Strong's number means to set out for a definite point or goal, it's the point aimed at. In other words, when it says and, it should be almost be like the end zone of a football field. This is where we're headed. So Messiah is where the Torah is headed. He's the goal of the Torah. In Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47, listen to what the, it says about the Torah. He said to them, set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children. Be careful to observe all the words of this Torah, for it is not a futile thing for you because it is what? Wow. And by this word, it says, and by this word, you're going to prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. Now, look at 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is what? It's say, so if you do away with the Torah, guess what? You just did away with all sin. If, if sin's a transgression of the Torah and you throw out the Torah, guess what? You don't need grace because you're not breaking any laws because they don't exist. You don't even need grace. God can't get on your case for something there's no law for. Ezekiel 18, 20 says the soul that sinneth is going to die. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is the wages of sin still death? But look what's in the Torah. Exodus 34, 7. God keeps mercy for thousands and he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Aren't we glad for the grace that's found in the Torah? Now this helps you explain Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. When he says, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. This is quoting Exodus 34, 7. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now people say, well, see, the Torah was nailed to the cross. Well, that's really stupid. It's not the Torah that was nailed to the cross. It was what? It was our sins. Uh, another way of translating that handwriting of ordinances, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. One of them could be your certificate of debt. It's the IOU. You paid off the mortgage. Okay. It's your sins. It's the debt that you owed that he nailed to the cross. That was the handwriting of ordinances against us. Look at Matthew 18, 24 through 27. This talks about the, the guy he had begun to reckon one was brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had. Payment was to be made. The servant therefore fell down, worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him and forgave him the debt. This is what was nailed to the cross. Is our sin our debt? Now the other thing that it could also mean the handwriting of ordinances against us this is a Jew talking to Gentiles. I think it could also mean a lot of the oral Torah. It could also mean a lot of those things that were put down to separate Jews and Gentiles that separated Jews and Gentiles. So either one of those is a better concept to me than thinking Torah was nailed to the cross. You know it couldn't have been Torah because that goes against all the rest of the scriptures. Does that make sense? All right, 8.30. All right. Thank you, guys. Have you enjoyed this teaching on Paul and all this stuff? <clears throat> Good. Well, next Monday night, we're going to have Chaim Richmond. Make sure to tell all your friends, neighbors, relatives, let's stand. We'll close with prayer. Father, again, we thank you so much that you not only sent the Torah to us, but you sent your son to show us what the Torah really was all about. 
You put flesh on your word. Yeshua didn't come to do away with the Torah. He came to put it on exhibition to show us your heart and how much you love us and how much grace there actually is in the Torah because he is full of grace and truth. So Father, I pray you give everyone a safe ride home and bring them back safely on Shabbat. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.